me because uh, Ted Karamuski and I have known each other for a long time. When we first met, my hair was black and he had hair. So, <laughs> neither of which are true in the present. So, um, Dater Karamuski, PhD in history from Loyola University of Chicago. He's a professor of history and director of the public history graduate program at Loyola University. He has research interests in the Civil War, Vietnam War, history of the Midwest, Native Americans, and the Great Lakes uh, region of public history. Uh, he was the founder of Loyola Public History Program in 1981, which was one of the first programs in the United States. Uh, he was the founding director of the National Council on Public History, which is a professional organization that represents people like us. Um, he served as president of that organization. Uh, he's very active as a practicing public historian. Uh, consulting on uh, a wide range of projects related to cultural researchers and serving as an expert witness in court cases. We were just chatting this morning, he, he recently been in Missoula, Montana, uh, as serving as an expert witness. Um, and we always talk classes on U.S. history and Canadian history. He's authored, co authored nine books and many articles and book chapters. Relevant to this occasion is his book, City of Public Memory Public Memory and Public Spaces in Chicago. Uh, which is now out, right? Uh, no. Oh, right. <laughs> it's in press. Here's Ted. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to bring down the scale a little bit. Also, something a little bit less profound, and also a subject that I think I assume most of us here are Chicago area residents with an understanding somewhat of the history of the metropolitan area. Some of you may be like me, lifetime Southsiders, uh, where we have a, maybe a more visceral connection uh, to some of the history that we're talking about here. So I'm going to kind of go through, you know, basically a chronology of, of the history of the Cal in, in a uh, quick way, and we can dig deeper in questions or comments later, okay? So we talked about the Anthropocene. Uh, I won't need to go into that any further, just move on from that. Let's talk about the Calumet. Uh, I mean, certainly the most outstanding element about understanding the Calumet region is the, its physical nature. We're talking about a vast area uh, along the Illinois-Indiana border that is, by nature, largely a wetland. And it's a wetland because of the recession of Glacial Lake Chicago uh, and uh, how gradually over the decades and centuries uh, Lake Chicago retreated to the current shape of Lake Michigan today. And one of the really dynamic features, of course, is that as the lake retreated gradually, it left a series of beach ridges. And so here, here you have this wetland at the bottom of Lake Michigan. And Lake Michigan itself is a gigantic barrier to east-west transportation. And so when you get to the bottom of Lake Michigan, from a transportation point of view, infrastructure needs to go through that area. And nature, in some ways, provided a means for that through these beach ridges, uh, elevated above the wetland uh, that covered so much of the rest of the topography. From a human point of view, uh, and people can talk, nat in term naturalists can talk about the, the biological aspect, but from a human point of view, an ecotone, uh, an area where diverse ecological zones meet, is a dynamic environment for human populations because it provides a variety of resources in a readily accessible manner. And that gets us to the native people who pioneered this area. Although the Potawatomi weren't the first Native American group to come into Chicago, they were the group that was here when historical uh, uh, events began to be recorded. And the, the ecotone of the Calumet region was a wonderful environment, ideal for hunting, for fishing, either in the lake or in the inland 
the numerous inland lakes, which we'll talk about, as well as the beach ridges, which could be farmed for agricultural purposes, and the Potawatomi were, were great uh, farmers. So one of the concepts that I want to uh, weave through this is that of environmental vision. When people come upon a landscape, when they come upon an environment, they look upon it and they make a strategic decision about how am I going to use this land? How am I going to exploit this for the benefit of myself, for my family? And from the Potawatomi point of view, it was let's exploit this ecotone, both the wetlands, the dry lands, the forest, the dunes, and the big lakes, is let's integrate the diversity of these resources into our uh, survival strategy. And that was very unique, because as we'll see what comes after that is, is, is a much more selective and intensive uh, vision instead of a more broad use of a region's resources. Uh, wetland is prominent in the name Calumet. Uh, if you take the Potawatomi word uh, for, the, for the region, refers to a low body of still water. Uh, and that certainly is Wolf Lake <laughs> uh, and you know, George Lake and, and, and so many uh, of the others. Now, all people, all creatures, whether it's the grass on your lawn uh, or it's the uh, actions of individuals, all creatures in the world exploit the environment. And by their exploitation of the environment, they change the environment. And the Potawatomi were no different. By making choices about what resources to uh, utilize, uh, they affected those populations. This is particularly true, however, once the capitalist system is introduced to the region by initially French fur traders and then later Scots and English and even American uh, traders come in. And they have a particular value for the aquatic mammals in the region, beavers and muskrats in particular. And so once native people are integrated uh, into a worldwide economic system, uh, this very diverse exploitation of the environment becomes a little bit, just a little bit, more focused. Uh, and, and that affects these populations. It doesn't have a big impact on uh, the topography or the land uh, in the Calumet region. That's not the case, for example, if you go up to, say, northern Michigan, northern Wisconsin. When you wipe out the beaver populations there, uh, it's going to greatly affect the rivers, and the rivers are going to affect Lake Michigan. But that's, it's, a, it's a relatively minor impact we're talking about in the Calumet region, unless you're a beaver or a muskrat. <laughs> One of the dominant themes that comes in the wake of Native American use of the region is Chicago. Chicago is the 800-pound gorilla that uh, tromps all over the history of the Calumet region. Uh, and so everything we're going to talk about, for good or for ill, uh, in, in, that follows, flows out of this relationship that the Calumet region has with Chicago. And I want to put particular emphasis on the impact of human actions on the wetlands themselves. And the first real effect that I want to touch on is agricultural use uh, of the wetland environment. In the 19th century, beginning in the 1830s really, we go ahead and see moving into the region uh, uh, various Euro-American groups, but an important one uh, were immigrants from Holland. Uh, they had experience farming lands reclaimed from the water, from the ocean. This was, a, anybody who's ever been to Holland, you know this, uh, and so it's a part of their tradition. And so when they come to the marshlands of the Calumet, their environmental vision is very different than the Potawatomi 
And so they look at it from a, from a much more focused point of view about how can we make this an agricultural place. And of course, the way they're going to do that is by draining some of the wetlands. Uh, and the product that's going to be produced from that then are going to be truck, uh, agri truck garden agriculture. Uh, vegetables, fruits, and then in some cases, flowers. Uh, and there's a market for that. Uh, as Chicago becomes incorporated in 1837, you're beginning to, to have the, a burgeoning metropolis. Uh, and so there is a market for, we, we need a place close by to grow these things that the population of this growing place is demanding. Uh, and so, uh, inspired by this agricultural vision, Dutch, and then, you know, German and Irish and others, but the Dutch are, the, are, are a real key group here, come in and they bring their culture with them. Uh, but this is, this is hard work. Going ahead and digging the ditches to, cl to clear what this is hard, muddy, mucky work. Uh, and then planting your crops and harvesting them. This is literally stoop labor. Uh, and uh, so uh, these farmers loved to have big families <laughs> because that provided you with a useful labor source. And this type of agriculture is often called muck farming because of the uh, sticky, black, rich, heavily organic soil that's left when you drain uh, a place that's been a wetland for centuries. Uh, and, and, and really dynamic place uh, to, to grow things like celery, asparagus, um, onions. Uh, here we see another of the, this was, this is in South, this was South Holland. Uh, uh, Illinois. Uh, here's an onion farm uh, just a little bit further south uh, in the Calumet region. And key to the, 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 these communities working uh, was that so many of them were members of uh, the Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, which, for, which worked, they were all doing a lot of the same work with this truck garden farming, and then they have common religion uh, to share, and so uh, they create networks of trust uh, that is really important in the way the farms work, so they could work cooperatively in the peddling and selling of their produce. And that was to the Chicago market. And this is the old South Water Street market. And they would be taking every, you know, uh, in harvest time, they'd be taking their wagons from South Holland or Roseland uh, or uh, uh, across the Indiana border uh, to Chicago uh, in horse-drawn wagons where they would set up and dicker with the restaurant owners for the sale of their product. And you can still see some remnants of this if you go to that area of the city. The city of Chicago tried to create a historic district here uh, recently. Another important connection is that, okay, you can farm this, these, these, this mucky land uh, for you know, six, seven, eight years. But you have, you're constantly drawing out of there the organic wealth. And so you need to replace that. And the Chicago stockyards were like the perfect source for this. And so gondola cars of manure uh, would be exported from the stockyards to the Calumet region where they could then, and this is hard, again, hard, smelly work, spreading this out over your fields. Now eventually, and, and this lingers on well into the 20th century. My, my father used to come out to uh, the south, uh, the Calumet region, uh, and he would pick onions uh, and pickles. They would pick pickles too, for Vlasic pickles, he always told me. So that's always what we bought at home. But uh, by the time we get into 
the late 20s, 1930s, they're getting more and more competition with, with more year-round growing that's taking place in Southern California. Um, and so, uh, and suburbanization is happening in Chicago. And so the agricultural focus of the region, which still exists, uh, becomes lessened uh, over time. Uh, but there's an ecological cost to this whole lifestyle that existed. And it's a wonderful book by the novelist Edna Ferber, who's famous for Showboat. She wrote this book called So Big. And it's a story of one of these Dutch farmer, farming families. And it goes through the generations. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful novel to read that kind of just captures this whole moment in time. But because of that moment in time, whole populations of birds uh, are, are diminished, uh, insects, plants, animals, uh, and part, not all, but part of the wetland has been obliterated by this process. Second big attack on the wetland, of course, is industry. Uh, and this, again, is a matter of environmental vision. The farmers who came here, like the Potawatomi before them, they defined the land in one way. And James and Arthur Vissingen, Dutch immigrants, came initially with that same Dutch vision, we're going to have farms here and that. And they, and they, be, they begin to go ahead and uh, initially they bought land in the south side Chicago neighborhood of Roseland to sell for farms. But they begin to see another opportunity. And they transition into the marketing of land that they purchased from farming to marketing this to industrialists. They see a different advantage to the way where this place is and what the topography is. Uh, and in particular, you've got these industries, like say the North Chicago Rolling Mill, which built the first steel uh, rails ever made in the United States. They're running out of space on the north branch of the Chicago River. And so there's an opportunity. Where are you going to migrate to that you can still get big ships coming in with your iron ore, where you've got railroad connections for your coal, uh, and still a ready supply of workers? And of course, uh, that becomes the South Works of the United States Steel Corporation. Uh, uh, and again, now we see the wetlands taking the hit for this new environmental vision, for this new way to think of the Calumet region over time. Uh, a tremendous amount of slag <laughs> generated uh, by this plant, changing the landscape. And then they get even bigger, uh, moving over to uh, uh, the Gary Works, beginning uh, in 1906. And here, here building uh, the harbor, uh, impacting now uh, Lake Michigan uh, in, a, in a dramatic way. And here's the Calumet River. I believe that's the Acme uh, uh, coke plant and steel plant uh, uh, on the Calumet River there uh, with residential communities uh, abutting the, uh, uh, the site. And I think one of the most interesting things uh, about the Calumet region, and, and maybe not entirely unique, but fairly unique, is that here in this region, we see the three great elements that transform America in the 20th century coming together uh, with steel, oil, and auto production. And I think it's fair to say that if anybody had a, nobody had a bigger impact on the way America looks today than probably Henry Ford. Uh, and so, you know, uh, and the Calumet region is like the perfect place where everything comes together for the production of those products. And so we have the oldest Ford Motor Company uh, manufacturing facility in the United States here, still producing, going from the Model A to today's Ford Explorers. And so this is just an overview map of all the different types of production. And again, this is tied to Chicago. Uh, so that for, for you know, the Calumet region provides 95% of Chicago's jobs 
in the metal making industry. This is 1957, I should point out. 72% of the petroleum and coal products are coming out of the Calumet region. 30% of chemicals, stone, clay, and glass production are tearing down the dunes <laughs> for glass. Uh, and 21% of the transportation equipment. So it's really the workshop uh, of Chicago uh, that has blossomed from the, vis the vision of those first Dutch realtors way back in uh, the end of the 19th century. And I want to kind of conclude by talking about the fate, we're talking about the wetlands again, the fate of four of the large lakes of the Calumet region. Cali Lake Calumet, Hyde Lake, Wolf Lake, George Lake, and Barry Lake, as you can see all three right, right there uh, in this image. And that was a, another sort of industry, another uh, way of looking at the lake, uh, excuse me, at the Calumet region, uh, was that these lakes were a marvelous place for recreation. And you had sports clubs here, you had uh, individuals who made their living as pot hunters, uh, going ahead and, you know, killing large amounts of waterfowl, of which there were plenty, uh, and then selling them to area restaurants. Here's pictures of the Calumet uh, uh, Gun Club, uh, which was eventually obliterated by uh, the uh, uh, Standard Oil uh, refinery in Whiting. And the lakes were another resource. You know, before there was widespread electrification, the only way to keep things cool was with ice. And you needed to have sources of ice near the metropolis once more. And Lake Calumet, Wolf Lake, uh, Berry Lake, uh, all were sources for the ice uh, that was then exported to Chicago. Well, that's just, no, never mind. <laughs> so uh, here we go ahead and, you know, you, many of you have been to Eggers Woods. And uh, Heinrich Egger owned that land, uh, he lived on that land uh, for a time before it became Forest Preserve, but he, was very, he and his brother were very much involved in a number of industries in the Hammond, Indiana area, and in particular in harvesting ice from Berry Lake. And these are the, uh, the uh, structures that he built for his ice workers, so that they could live near where they were, where they were getting the ice from, uh, and it's right on the shore of, of Berry Lake. Uh, but he sold out when he heard uh, that uh, John D. Rockefeller's operation was shopping for land in the Calumet region. Uh, and so uh, uh, he quickly got, he got out at the right time, as it were. And Berry Lake becomes uh, pretty much obliterated not entirely, but mostly by uh, the building of the Standard Oil and now the BP uh, refinery complex. And again, this, is, this, was, a, this was a huge part of the, of the wetland uh, and sacrificed in order to go ahead and get the petrochemical industry uh, into the region. Wolf's another one of the lakes, of course, and it, it undergoes dramatic changes, as, as most of you know. Um, so here's sort of a natural picture of, of Wolf Lake. But then over time, with all of the steel industries around it, you have these slag depositions that go ahead and shrink the size uh, of Wolf Lake. And then finally in the 1950s, they built a goddamn interstate expressway through this lake. I mean, this... This is not, when you think of environmental vision, this is not thinking of Wolf Lake as a recreational asset. This is like, it's here, it's in the way, and we're going to go forward uh, to create that transportation network. And we all, anybody who drives <laughs> through the south side of Chicago knows that you've got three interstate expressways all narrowed down into one corridor to get around the bottom of the lake through Calumet. And so they were willing to do anything uh, to, to make that happen. But people always did think there were always others. 
You have a counter vision. Say, hey, okay, well, you're building the expressway, but we're still going to use this area. We still, we still value it as a place for some serenity and access to the outdoors. And uh, so here we see the state of Illinois dedicating uh, a state park at Wolf Lake. What, what date is that in? Uh, in I think this is the 1940s. I think it's the 46 when they dedicate the, okay. the monument. I, I was looking at the top. I couldn't see a date on it. Okay, another one of the lakes is Hyde Lake, which stood between Lake Calumet and... Uh, Wolf Lake, uh, but again, the slag, the steel mills, just obliterate it. And they would build tracks and it, it'd bring railroad cars day after day dumping slag and filling in wetlands as well as some of these very large, not very deep, but very large lakes in the region. And finally, Lake Calumet which was a much larger, we're sitting here on the shores of it right now, but a much larger, cleaner body of water than we have today. But even by 1882, more than 30 acres of the lake had been consumed by industrial waste, largely slag. And so just in the 20th century, what we've kind of just rapidly gone through, 40% of the wetlands in, uh, in the Chicago area, which is mostly down here in Calumet, have been filled in. And so we have these communities emerge that are so important, but we don't think of them as, uh, uh, as having been transformative of our natural wetland area here in Calumet. And so huge amounts, uh, one square mile of marshland filled in to go ahead and build the industrial and residential areas of Pullman. But the big transformation for Lake Calumet is not just Pullman showing up on its western shore, but is to, when the decisions are made to make it part of a navigational improvement. And again, it's that family, now it's, it's the son of the uh, of the entrepreneurs who first said, let's go ahead and have industry here. Uh, Van Visigen comes up with this plan uh, to transform Lake Calumet into Chicago's industrial harbor. Now, there was a lot of an maritime activity on, uh, on the Calumet River, the Calumet Harbor earlier. But now they want to go ahead and have uh, a, a, a place to bring the ore ships and the coal barges uh, into Calumet, they want to have it where you can build industry all around it, where there's plenty of space uh, to do that. In some ways, I think it was like a really bad idea. <laughs> uh, because uh, from a maritime point of view, and this is one of the problems that the Port of Chicago has today, uh, is that when you decide you're going to use Lake Calumet as your harbor, you're requiring gigantic, and every year the ships get bigger, till now they're, some of them are a thousand feet long. You're requiring them to take this long journey up the Calumet River, uh, where there are numerous bridge crossings. Uh, and that costs time and money. The lakes are only open for navigation for part of the year. And the steel companies need to get their supplies uh, uh, delivered to them in a guaranteed way. And so you could, what uh, Daniel Burnham called for was building an outer harbor protected by breakwaters, but building an outer harbor at the mouth of the Calumet River, which would have saved a lot of navigation time. Uh, and it's one of the problems that the Port of Chicago has is that ships don't want to go up the Calumet River. But so much, Chicago kept building along and transforming Lake Calumet. And they really did a tremendous amount of uh, more work in the late 1950s preparing for the St. Lawrence Seaway, 
which in 1959 was allegedly going to connect the oceans of the world with the city of Chicago. But the St. Lawrence Seaway was one of the worst things we ever did to the Great Lakes because of all the invasive species that came in its way. But nobody anticipated that, except there was an eight-year-old boy who wrote to Dwight D. Eisenhower and said this would happen. <laughs> but, but I didn't listen. Uh, but more importantly, the whole project was underbuilt. And so great amount, a large amount of ocean building vessels never really showed up. Yet we transformed Lake Calumet anyway. And then the worst thing is, what a lot of those ships brought? They brought automobiles and steel. Wasn't that what we were making here? They brought in the foreign competition that ended up taking some of the jobs. So deindustrialization follows, of course. And the tragic, I always remember, the tragic closing of Wisconsin Steel and the sleazy execution of that by the International Harvester Corporation. Uh, South Works closing uh, much later, 1992. Uh, but what does this do? We're having these changes. And it's the steel industry is still huge in the region. And it's still very important to Amer the fate of American uh, manufacturing, what we do here in the Calumet region. But it opens up an opportunity. And this was sort of the challenge for our, like our generation, is how do we respond to this? Uh, what environmental vision do we have? And I think that's the kind of interesting thing that happens is then a rediscovery of the wetlands as a good thing uh, and a desire to reconnect with, some, with, with that which had been here from the very beginning. And so here we are at Big Marsh, uh, which is, you could use as a poster child uh, for all the ill that's been done to the Calumet region through these alternate visions of the environment. Uh, but also, it's a place now where we can move from brownfields uh, to parks. Uh, and with the creation of these facilities, providing niches for the biodiversity of the Calumet region uh, to rebound. And that's what I got for you today. <laughs>